So uh, I'm going to first introduce uh, Dr. Lorigio, and I'm going to read. Now, the other thing is, in your brochure, uh, you'll see not the bio, but you're going to see the general topic of each speaker, OK? So Dr. Arthur Lorigio is a psychologist, a senior dean for faculty at the College of Arts and Sciences, and professional, prof uh, professor of criminal justice, criminology, and psychology at Loyola, Loyola University in Chicago. He's also a member of the graduate faculty and director of the Center for Advancement of Research, Training, and Education at Loyola. In 2003, Dr. Lorigio was named a faculty scholar. That's the highest honor bestowed upon any senior faculty member at Loyola. He's a scholar among scholars, to say it very simply. I won't go into all of his awards, but um, there are, there's a couple that I want to mention. Um, in, uh, he was re received the Hans Maddock Award in 2003, the Champion for Recovery Award, which is extremely important, Excellence in Research Award in 2009, and Extremely Distinguished. I'll just mention that his research is focused primarily in the areas of offender substance use disorders and comorbidity, drug treatment, mental health disorders, crime, corrections, and community relations. And the other thing he knows about is he knows a lot about the Cook County Jail. So, welcome. Good morning. My pleasure to be with you and note how much I, I admire the University of South Florida. I'm from a Jesuit Catholic institution and our primary guiding principle is social justice and it permeates all aspects of what we do from an academic standpoint, scholarly standpoint, and community outreach and collaboration standpoint. And you embody that here. And um, I want to commend you and the relationships that the university has built and continues to build with the community. They're quite admirable. Thank you for, for all you do. I've been uh, working at the interface of criminal justice and, and mental health my entire career and I have fancied myself, I guess, a boundary spanner, as Hank Stedman coined that term uh, decades ago. Uh, and it's actually been advantageous for me. Uh, I, I grew up in the mental health system. I started uh, my earliest training as a clinical psychologist in a state institution and also in a community mental health center. And I became um, a researcher uh, to, to uh, supplement my income as a graduate assistant in the Cook County uh, court system, which is the largest unified court system in the United States in Chicago. So it was, it was serendipity that I was able to blend my, my two lives together. But my passion has always been doing research and advocacy and program building for people with serious mental illness. And to work with you in seeking remedies for this troubled population has really been my reason for being uh, a, as an academic and as a psychologist and as a good citizen. People are, are becoming increasingly mentally ill in the United States. I've been examining uh, ep ep epidemiological data since the, the 1950s when we first started doing community surveys to be able to measure the prevalence of, of mental illness in the general population. And those surveys have become increasingly more sophisticated. And there are a variety of indices to determine whether somebody has been disabled by their illness or disease. All illnesses or, or diseases in some respects can be disabling. Mental illness in particular, serious mental illness, is quite disabling. And our data show that rates of, of serious mental illness ha have increased sixfold since the middle of the 1950s, uh, headed uh, to date. And we've also, as we're uh, aware of increasingly, uh, our suicide uh, rate 
is, is going up relative to our homicide rate in the United States. Homicides have been dropping uh, significantly since the early 1990s to date, and suicides have been going up. And in particular, suicides among young people uh, have been going up. And uh, the opioid uh, crisis has added another um, element uh, to the, the kind of catastrophic effect that mental illnesses have on people in the United States. And when we see mental illnesses going up, at the same time we see the social safety net, it's shrinking. It continues to shrink. And we, we're, we're, we're not sure exactly what the configuration of services are going to look like in the next couple of years uh, with the impending repeal of the Affordable uh, Care Act. Note that in Cook County, we had a county equivalent to the Affordable uh, Car uh, Care Act called County Cares. And part of that through part of that initiative, we registered 40,000 people in the jail and the court system uh, for uh, community-based care funded through the Affordable Care Act. And now we see that our resources are, are being taken away and the social safety net is shrinking. There's no question that people with mental illness are overrepresented in, in the criminal justice system. And it was first noted um, in the early 1970s by a, uh, I, I wouldn't call him a colleague, I'd call him somebody I admire greatly and I, I honored at the university. His name was Mark Abramson. He's still a psychiatrist uh, in the Los Angeles County Jail. And he wrote the first academic article uh, in 1972 noting that people with mental illness were being criminalized because he was seeing uh, increasing numbers of people with mental illness coming through the jail. But there's no question, this is incontrovertible. People with mental illness are overrepresented at every step in the criminal justice process. From arrest all the way to post-incarceration release, you see an abundance of people with mental illness compared with the proportion of people with mental illness in the general population, which is quite high. And of course, there are a variety of mental illnesses. There are 20 categories in the DSM-5, and depends on how you count them, there are up to 300 uh, distinct uh, uh, diagnostic categories. So there's lots of ways to measure mental illness, and mental illness varies tremendously. I'm focused in my work on people with serious mental illness defined as bipolar disorder, schizophrenia spectrum disorders, and major depression. The federal government over the past few decades has given considerable attention to this problem. Uh, through legislation, through the funding of organizations and institutions such as the Gaines Center, the Council of State Government, and other entities. So we have not neglected the, the problem in, in the sense that we've observed it, we've written about it. Uh, the, the consensus project of the, of the county, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, county of, of Council of State Governments, the consensus project on criminal justice and mental health publishes materials for practitioners and researchers alike on a regular basis. I, I work with Rutgers University and the Center for Behavioral Health Services and Criminal Justice Research. So there's tremendous focus on the problem. Uh, given um, the amount of energy that, that we have given over to it, it's remarkable to me that that kind of energy and enthusiasm and research excellence has not translated into a better life for people with serious mental illness involved in the system. I, I always believe that, that it was deinstitutionalization that, that created the problem of the mental illness in the criminal justice system. It contributed to it, but it certainly didn't create it. Deinstitutionalization started in the mid-1950s uh, when there were 560,000 people in state institutions. And that was a major change in, how, in, in, uh, in public policy regarding the hub of care for people with mental illness. Uh, and that initiative uh, really gained a lot of energy in the, in the early 1960s with the, with the passage of the Community Mental Health Center Act. 
So people started coming out of the hospital in the mid-1950s, and the release from the hospital accelerated in the mid-1960s because of the creation of entitlement programs. And there was a shifting of, of the cost for caring for people with chronic mental illness from the state budget to the federal budget. Uh, so I coined the term transinstitutionalization. We never had deinstitutionalization. People went from the state hospital to another type of institution. And the, ones, the one institution they were filling up in great numbers is a nursing home. But they also were coming into jail in increasing numbers and, and also being processed through other steps in the criminal justice process. But the, the real uh, causal factors in, in the criminal justice system's abundance of people with mental illness being processed at every step are harsher crime control policies and draconian drug laws. So we were changing uh, mental health policy beginning in the early 1960s and in the late 1960s, we began changing criminal justice policy. It began with the Nixon administration. The tough on crime began in the late 1960s. And there's, there's a, a graph that I show my students all the time because uh, it's so dramatic. The prison population for most of the 20th century Per, in measuring it per capita was flat until, in, until the 1970s. It's flat. It's a little, it's a flat line. And then you move into the mid 70s and 80s and 90s and it goes way up and precipitously. So we were arresting more people, prosecuting more people, locking more people up. At the same time, there are more people in the general population with, with mental illness. And the criminal justice net, it widened. And, it, and people with mental illness, because there's more of them, and here's an important point to make that most of you probably already know. We, we had a, a fairly good plan for opening up the door to allow people to leave the state institution in relatively short periods of time. So we let them out the door, and we took fewer in the front door because of of many uh, reforms in, in mental health law it became increasingly more difficult to involuntarily commit people for serious mental illness. So fewer in the front, letting more out the back. We let them out the back door and there's nothing there for them in the community. There's a paucity of services. So we never realized the infrastructure of community-based care that was promised by President Kennedy in the early 1960s. So I, I worked in a community mental health center and we were not seeing people coming out of the state institution at our mental health center. In Chicago, there used to be 40 some mental health centers all over the city. There's fewer than half that number now. But when I worked there, it was mostly people with, with at the time, right before the advent of, of DSM-3, we used to classify uh, less serious mental illnesses as uh, neuroses. So, Coming in to the community mental health center for me to do therapy as a very young man, not sure if I was a very good therapist, but I tried. I tried to help people. They, they were people who still had jobs that, were, that had a stable family, that had a place to live. We couldn't get people to come from the hospital into the community mental health center because there was no linkage program. No one brought them over. They were released from the hospital, and they were given a, an, an address on a card. Remember, it was a, literally an index card. Go to this address uh, to continue your services and meds. And they hardly ever, ever came. I, could, I created an outreach program. They got more of them in the door because psychiatric time was really expensive. But they didn't come. Gross social, economic, and racial disparities in services contributes greatly to the increasing, uh, ever increasing number of people with mental illness in the criminal justice system. And I say ever increasing, but we've never demonstrated that that's the case. We've never done uh, national studies that would be very expensive to determine exactly what proportion of people in the criminal justice system have mental illness. And uh, we have never clearly defined and measured mental illness in a way that would be useful for us to track those numbers. But it's considerable. Estimates suggest that it's 16 to 20 uh, percent of people have mental illness in jails and prisons 
and on probation. That's based mostly on people's self-reports. Mark, how am I doing on time? Here's my focus. It's on untreated comorbidities. Dr. Peters is a leader in that area. He's here, uh, and uh, I'm proud to have him as a colleague. Here's what I've learned in my 30 plus years of working in the jail and the probation system. I hardly ever, uh, and as a staff psychologist in the jail, I volunteer. I don't see anyone with one type of mental illness only. People have a passel of problems, people who are in the jail. They suffer from serious mental illness. They suffer from substance use disorders, which is also a serious mental illness. So it's substance use disorders and other psychiatric disorders. That's the rule. It isn't the exception. And on top of all of that, they are struggling with many other problems in, in living. And in particular, I found uh, that working uh, on housing is, is the key to getting people situated in the community in a manner that allows them to live an effective life. They have to have a place. So after they leave prison, they need a place. After they leave jail, they need a place. And thank you. And, and they need a place that recognizes that people suffer from multiple morbidities. People who are involved in the criminal justice system with mental illness have addiction. They have trauma. They have family and housing problems. And they have few resources and support. And they are highly stigmatized. I, I'm working on a study now of, of multiple stigmatizations. Think about people in the criminal justice system with mental illness. How many ways are they stig uh, stigmatized? Oh, they're criminals. There's one. They're addicts. There's two. They're crazy. There's three. They're homeless. There's four. So having one of those stigmatizations is, is a burden. Having four of them is catastrophic. It cripples people because other people don't look at them uh, in a manner that's sympathetic, understanding, and helpful. I'm going kind of slow. I might not get through all my slides, but I, these are the main messages I want you to hear today are in the earliest slides. So, so also, no, we talk about you know, the, uh, people with, with mental illness in the criminal justice system, and I want to ask, well, well, who are they? because they're, they're not a, a monolithic group. They're not a homogeneous group. I mentioned earlier, uh, it, more than 200 types of psychiatric disorders in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and, and they vary uh, onset and, and type, severity and course and prognosis, and, and people with mental illness involved in the criminal justice system are not alike. And research that I've uh, done has shown that they can be generally categorized into three different varieties, although these are not um, impermeable boundaries. But I found that there are people who are in the criminal justice system really because of criminalization. Criminalization in strict definition means that you're arrested, prosecuted, and convicted because of a public display of mental illness. The signs and symptoms were public and scary. Most of the time, criminalization occurs not because of the person with mental illness being disruptive and scary, sometimes they are, but because the police don't handle that encounter very effectively. The police fail, in many instances, to de-escalate. And, and if, you, if, you, if you can begin to de-escalate de immediately, there's a, lesser, uh, uh, there's a less, lesser likelihood of arrest, there's lesser likelihood of injury to the officer and to the person with mental illness. So police who are not trained at that first encounter, because they're street corner psychiatrists, police, they're not trained, and then you have a, de a, a devolving situation and an arrest for assault on a police officer, which is a felony. 
or uh, you have resisting arrest. And then the person is put in handcuffs and then they're going to jail. That, that's criminalization. But I found that, that that represents maybe a third of people who end up in the system. Also a large number of people end up in the system because they need to survive and they commit survival type crimes. Uh, minor drug sales, uh, prostitution, they're, they're a sex worker, uh, shoplifting, because they have no other means of income. And they're arrested for low level offenses, for misdemeanors, and they come in and out of, of the jail uh, multiple times. We, we created a specialized court uh, for women, uh, sex workers, so they wouldn't be repeatedly recycled in and out of the system. We provided them with services first and community-based uh, support. So there's categories of people who come in because they're criminalized. There's categories of people, and within categories, there are subcategories of people who come in because they just need to survive and they commit petty crimes. But then there's a fairly large category of people who come into the system because they commit serious crimes, they commit felonies. And so I stopped thinking uh, in, as either or. I used to think either a, a person is criminally inclined or they have mental illness. So if they're in the system and they have mental illness, they only have mental illness. That isn't true. Uh, the thousand people we treat every day in the Cook County Jail are in the Cook County Jail mostly because they were arrested for felonies. So I found that there was a category of people with mental illness who go in and out of both the criminal justice and the mental health systems with great regularities. That they have lengthy criminal histories, they have lengthy uh, histories of psychiatric hospitalization. So they move between uh, both of the systems. And, and uh, the, the more likely you are uh, to end up in one system, the more likely you are to end up in the other if you have what I call intersecting trajectories. So you have a trajectory of, of your mental illness and how it's pro progressing, and you have a, your trajectory uh, in what we call a criminal career. And with people with mental illness in the system, they, in, they intersect. Know that, that people with mental illness commit crimes for the same reasons, and their crimes are explained by the same risk factors as people who don't have serious mental illness. Um, our colleagues in Canada have done tremendous research in identifying the major risk factors uh, in crime and recidivism. And they're the same ones if you have mental, serious mental illness or if you don't. You have antisocial personality. Attitudes are antisocial. Your cognitions are antisocial. Most important, your associates are antisocial. And you have a lengthy criminal history. So if you have one arrest, the likelihood of a second arrest goes up. If you have two, the likelihood of a third arrest goes up, et cetera, et cetera. It's also true, uh, I've done a small study on this, one admission to a psych hospital, if you're poor and you're homeless and you don't have resources, is gonna pretty much lead to a second and a second even greater likelihood of leading to a third. Other risk factors include lack of education, lack of employment, drug abuse and dependence, although we don't call them that anymore in DSM-5. If you have an addiction problem and you have antisocial personality disorder and you're poor and you have mental illness, you are going to be in the criminal justice system. There's a, there's a high likelihood. So think about it in this way. Uh, mental illness itself, um, it, it doesn't uh, cause criminal behavior usually. A very small percentage of people commit crimes as a direct product of, of the symptoms of their mental illness. It's mental illness with addiction, with antisocial personality disorder, with poverty, and also include in there age. And where you live really matters. Uh, people with serious mental illness and people who are, are criminally involved uh, to a great extent, they come from the same environments. So think about a, a big Venn diagram. You have a rectangle. And it's people who live below the poverty level. They're in there. 
We have one circle, people with serious mental illness, another circle, people who are uh, heavily involved in criminal activities. There is tremendous intersection between those two circles. And it's that gray area that you shade in the intersection of the circles. That's where I work. That's the population that I serve. But there's tremendous overlap. As think about what um, 60 years of research tells us. It tells us that people with mental illness are not only disproportionately represented in the criminal justice system, but they're disproportionately represented in areas of poverty. And we have different explanations for that. One used to be popular, used to be downward drift. People with serious mental illness, they can't do well in school, they can't get a job. Maybe they started out at a, at a higher uh, rung of the socioeconomic ladder and then mental illness came and they went down. But now we've learned in the most recent research that it's stressful being poor. Stress can precipitate serious mental illness in people who are vulnerable. And poor people don't have access uh, to primary care. So if you get treatment for mental illness early, you have a, a greater likelihood of being able to manage and recover from your mental illness. Research that I've, I've done shows the, the longer you wait for your first instance of care of serious mental illness, the less likely uh, you are uh, to have uh, recovery that provides you with the kinds of skills and competencies you need to function at a very, fairly high level. So I think there's irreversible clinical deterioration. Uh, being, being mentally ill um, is uh, a, a perturbation to your brain, and if it's not treated early on, it's going to probably alter your brain in a way that's going to be very, very difficult to change, even with the most effective medications. So people with mental illness and people who are involved in the criminal justice system, they share the same criminogenic and pathogenic environments. We really do have to pay attention to place variables and the kinds of interventions that, that we design. I'm just going to say, OK, thank you, Mark. I want to say a little something about, sir, I'm going to skip over a couple. So the point that I'm making is that there's no clear pathogenesis between mental illness alone and criminal behavior. And many studies have showed that, that if you, if you take out all of the other factors that explain uh, criminal behavior and to explain the relationship between mental illness and crime, take out all the factors, leave the mental illness in alone, it isn't related to criminal behavior. So mental illness alone doesn't cause crime, so the treatment of mental illness alone will do very little uh, to prevent or reduce crime and recidivism. However, however, this is a big however. Remember, I'm, I'm an advocate for treatment. Treatment and more treatment. Here's how I see it. A treatment of serious mental illness is a necessary but not sufficient condition to help people with mental illness who are criminally involved on the road to recovery. But it's the hub, and there's a lot of spokes in the wheel. You need uh, to get uh, people stabilized. You can't treat people effectively in an approach that does reduce their criminal behavior unless you treat their symptoms of mental illness. And, and, and then they can be amenable. We have great packages of of, of cognitive behavioral therapy that really work in reducing people's criminal tendencies. Dr. Peters could tell you about those, those programs. And he, what he'll also tell you today is that Art's right when Art says that we need fully integrated, coordinated care for people with co-occurring disorders. People with mental health problems and addiction, which is a type of mental health problem, need particular kinds of programming, not concomitant care, not sequential care. Roger and I have been writing about this for maybe 25 years. Fully integrated treatment. And there are new models now, uh, the matrix model is one, in which we group different services into modules. Treat people, 
Don't treat illnesses. And treat people's multiple problems in the same coordinated, integrated package of services. And the coordination is critical. The providers of different kinds of, of services have to be in communication with one another. And the old case management approach isn't really old. It still works, where you have somebody coordinating those services, making sure they're integrated, making sure they're comprehensive, making sure they're coordinated in a module. The biggest problem we have is a fragmentation of the treatment system. And the, the biggest challenge that I've had in my career is this, that we treat people well in our, our county jail. We have uh, 1,000 people every day being treated for serious mental illness in the Cook County Jail. The state of the art of psychiatric services and meds, we have acute care, we have intermediate care, we have tertiary care, and it works well. I see people when they come in uh, who are in the throes of, of psychotic episodes, and when they leave, they've cleared. Here's my biggest challenge, Mark. They, they leave the jail, and they go into the community, and they are not linked to services. We've started linkages, linkage programs, and those have been helpful. I worked with Thresholds. I don't know if any of you have heard of Thresholds, but the key was we really did this. We had somebody with Thresholds meet the detainee at the gate of the jail, because in Chicago, you can be released from the jail 24-7 at any time. We got a call from the jail that someone was leaving, and someone from Thresholds met them at the gate and said, do you have somewhere to live? If not, come with me. I have an apartment for you, and you'll be seeing a psychiatrist tomorrow. And the Thresholds uh, a person had a small caseload, worked in a team of assertive community treatment. And we had great success, but we ran out of funding. And we didn't have any way to, to, to continue that program. But one that was working, it was working. Thank you so much for your attention.